All right. Here we are again. Welcome back to uh, our cognition course. Moving on into uh, the sixth lecture here in short term and working memory. Today we're going to talk about the central executive and executive functioning, or particularly executive attention. Um, we'll start by uh, talking about uh, some what the central executive is doing, uh, some tasks used to test the central executive, and then we'll talk uh, about um, executive attention and uh, Randy Ingalls model of or uh, views of uh, executive attention in particular, uh, the two factors he has associated with executive attention, and uh, talk a little bit about that. And then in the following lecture, we're actually going to get into um, tests of working memory capacity that are particularly tied to uh, this idea of executive attention and uh, how those tasks in the lecture after that are tied in with a number of um, different kinds of tasks, in particular abilities and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff to cover in that. But let's get started here uh, today. Uh, we're going to talk about what the central executive does. It integrates information from the phonological loop the visual spatial sketch pad and the episodic buffer. Uh, as I've said previously, we're not going to really talk much about the episodic buffer. The evidence behind it is uh, not well established. The idea is this is just an uh, expanded memory uh, for uh, the central executive and other systems. It, it's not something we'll get too much into, but just know that it's some interaction with long-term memory. But the central executive plays a major role in attention, planning, and coordination. Uh, in particular, it's basically sort of in charge. It's master of the system and is in charge of uh, keeping the information going in the subsystems and directing attention, planning, and coordinating for future activities. Uh, the central executive is importantly responsible for suppressing irrelevant information. So if we are trying to focus on one thing, we need to ignore irrelevant information. Uh, as we get older, this starts to become more difficult, and you can see in older adults, uh, their mind wanders a bit because they can't suppress that irrelevant information. And so you end up uh, with um, information coming out that was really would have been suppressed had they been younger. Uh, the other really important function of the central executive is to inhibit responses. And this we'll talk a little bit more about uh, under executive attention, but basically trying to keep yourself uh, from from responding in a certain way uh, and uh, basically uh, controlling our actions is really a big part of what the central executive does um, and so it's a particularly important ability and one we'll talk about that one of the biggest problems with uh, this particular memory system is it's susceptible to uh, damage in particular people who have uh, head injuries, closed head trauma, mild traumatic brain injury, oftentimes have damage to the frontal lobes, and it's this kind of functioning that gets damaged. So um, some characteristics of the central executive include that uh, there is planning and coordination of information, but not storage. Uh, storage occurs in the subsystem, so these are in the uh, phonological loop and the visual spatial sketch pad. Uh, so the information's there, but the central executive is telling those systems, what to do with that information, what to pay attention to, what to ignore, what kind of responses to give, what not to give. All of this is in charge of uh, the uh, central executive. Uh, so to give you a flavor of some clearly central executive tasks, um, we'll talk a little bit about this kind of planning and coordinating uh, aspect of the central executive. And the first of these is called the Wisconsin card sorting task. Uh, and this one I like. Uh, there are uh, sort of more empirically derived versions of this that are have lots more data to go along with them. But this one's easy, at least it's easy for me to explain, it's easy to see um, how to demonstrate what's called a perseverative error or perseveration. And one of the things that happens in people with damage to the frontal lobes, in particular uh, to executive functioning, is they tend to perseverate. That is, they keep trying the same thing over and over again, despite the fact uh, that it doesn't appear to be uh, changing. So here's the Wisconsin card sorting test. So uh, in this, the uh, person who's being tested uh, will see these sort of four exemplar cards. So the person giving the test will lay these out. Uh, and then there's a whole stack of these cards. And the person giving the 
test will select an attribute uh, to sort the cards based on. And so, for example, you can see that there are three different attributes that this card might match. It could be color, it could be shape, uh, or it could be uh, number of objects. So it could fit any of the last three cards. It certainly can't fit the first card. Uh, so what happens is the person who's being tested will place this card on the pile they think it should go, go with. So if it's number of objects, it'll go in the second uh, slot. Uh, if it's shape, it goes in the third. If it's color, it goes in the last. Um, and so they'll have to hypothesis test because the person giving the test will just say yes or no. So if, I, if it were me and I put it here on that uh, number two pile and they said yes, I would know it was number of objects. If they said no, then I would have to go on to shape. If they still said no, then I'd know it was color. Uh, so what happens is they use the same attribute for a few trials and then they switch. So we go from color to shape. So now I sort this card to color and the person says no. Well now I know I have to switch because it was color, it must be something else now. So I have to use that previous information on a subsequent trial uh, to try to um, plan out my next action. And so this is where that sort of planning and coordinating comes in. This is relatively easy for somebody with normal executive functioning, but somebody who has had some kind of damage will keep trying the same thing over and over again. So they'll perseverate. So they'll do that kind of perseverative error. And that's a really important uh, attribute of uh, this particular um, task and uh, with uh, central executive functioning. So some other central executive tasks are things like what we call an N back task. Um, and basically the N stands for number of trials. And so uh, the way this works is you have to go back. So you'll be, say you'll be given a number of uh, digits. In a one back task, uh, you go back to the digit before. Um, and, per, per, and report it. In the, end back, in the two back task, you would have to go two back. But the thing is you have to remember digits are constantly coming. So if it's four, three, six, and then you go four, and then seven, you would say three. So it's four, three, six, seven, you go back to three. Um, so you have to keep a lot of information kind of going on. And some of these tasks get more difficult. You have to add the two together, um, that sort of thing. Um, other central executive tasks are things like a backward span task. So we've talked about digit span forward, where you have to remember a number of digits in a row. And the backwards digit span task, you have to reverse the order and report those digits in reverse order. So that's where the central executive comes in. It's involved in reversing that, uh, the order of that task. Uh, we're going to talk about the operation span task, um, which is uh, really the uh, primary way in which we talk about working memory capacity. Uh, today, and you're going to get a chance to try that out. Uh, it's, it's difficult, um, uh, but it certainly gets at what we mean by the ability of the central executive to, to operate on information. Um, and so we'll get to that uh, here in a subsequent lecture. But I want to present uh, the executive attention model of thinking about working memory capacity and working memory. So again, this is a um, proposed by uh, Engel and Kane. Um, uh, Randy Engel at Georgia Tech has done a, an enormous amount of research in this area uh, and has uh, really done some amazing work on uh, executive uh, attention, working memory capacity, and how it ties in with all kinds of things. Uh, really remarkable um, body of work. Uh, so what they proposed is an executive attention model of working memory capacity. Uh, and the things I want you to know about this are they um, propose two factors that are part of executive control. One is the maintenance of task goals and active memory. And so basically this factor is your ability to remember what you're supposed to keep doing. Uh, so in the experiment they describe, uh, participants are supposed to uh, keep their eyes from going to a blinking light uh, and so they have to remember that's what they're supposed to do. And people with higher levels of working memory um, are better able to do that because they're a better able to maintain that task goal in active memory. The other part of this uh, is the resolution of response competition or conflict. And so we talked already about um, some of this we talked about attention because we, talk, oh, we talked about the Stroop task um, and you've seen how that works and that's where we get at this sort of prepotent or habitual behavior so when you look at a word you're used to reading the word and with the Stroop task, you, of course, have to 
ignore the color, uh, uh, sorry, the word and focus on the color. Um, and so these prepotent or habitual behaviors that conflict with behaviors appropriate to your current goal um, is one of the things that is an important component of working memory. And so I want to talk, uh, sort of talk you through a little bit of this. Um, and in our other lectures, when we start talking about how working memory capacity is associated with a number of tasks, uh, we'll see that people with high levels of working memory uh, actually show greater levels of negative priming. And remember from negative priming, uh, that negative priming occurs because of that inhibition of the um, ignored stimulus. So what that shows is people with higher levels of working memory capacity are better able to ignore, or are more strongly ignoring, I guess is the way to think about it, uh, that uh, um, irrelevant stimulus or that stimulus that they're supposed to ignore. So this gets into this sort of um, inhibition part of uh, executive control. So one of the things that um, Kane and Ingle show is that the Stroop test gets very different when you have rare incongruent trials. So remember in a congruent trial in the Stroop task, it's where the color matches the word. In an incongruent trial, it's where the color is different from the word. Um, and typically those are done um, sort of as separate tasks. So by the time you've gone all the way through the incongruent list, you've gotten pretty good at it because you're not paying any attention to the word. And this, let's just give you a little flavor of what this might look like. So again, here you're supposed to read the color of the ink. <clears throat> so you can see it starts to get a little more difficult because you're so used to reading, uh, getting the word along with um, the color of the word. So uh, what uh, Kane and English show is that it becomes much more difficult the more rare they become. But again, people with high levels of working memory capacity are better at this. I wanted to show you um, a really good uh, real world example of this uh, that I have um, been encountering uh, in my own life. So I live in Washington, DC. I don't actually own a car, but I use a service called Car2Go. And these are cards that you can basically pick up wherever you can find one. They're, usually, they're on the street somewhere. There's an app that shows you where they are. And one of the cars that they have is uh, the Mercedes-Benz CLA and the Mercedes-Benz GLA. And um, what's important about that is where the gear shift is. So on the left, we have the Mercedes-Benz CLA. And you might not see the gear shift because it's there. And we'll take a closer look at this in a moment, but that's how you shift the gears uh, in the car. You pump it, up, pop it up to go into reverse, and down to go into drive, um, and then you push that button to put it into park. On the right, we have the Toyota Camry, the most popular car in America. Uh, the Toyota Camry, and almost every car I've ever driven, uh, including the Honda Accord we'll look at next, uh, that is the windshield wiper control. And one of the things that you do is you just push that lever up to get your windshield wipers to come on for a second when it's raining. So here we have again the Mercedes and the Honda Accord. It's the same thing. That's the, in the Mercedes, it's the gear shift and the Honda Accord, it's the windshield wipers. It's the same thing in almost every Nissan I've ever driven. Uh, most cars, uh, this is how uh, the windshield wipers work. The problem becomes, remember, when a prepotent or habitual behavior conflicts with behaviors appropriate to the current goal is part of this issue in working memory. Well, when it rains, drivers who have the habit of hitting that lever uh, to uh, kick on the windshield wipers with a little bit of rain end up putting the car in neutral. I know this because I've done it several times. And now I find when I drive the car, I have to remember that I'm not supposed to do that because it's so habitual. It is just such a habit. So you really have to be present. Well, um, again, this being Washington, D.C., people that are under stress, if there's a lot of traffic, uh, if there's anything else happening, you're trying to be on the phone, you're trying to do anything else, anything that's taking up working memory capacity um, is going to make it harder to inhibit that response. And again, these are used by car to go a business based entirely on people who relatively rarely need a car. Um, because if you needed a car all the time, you would own one. And these are simply ones that you can run back and forth places to. 
Uh, it's a handy feature, and I love these. I have to say the Mercedes GLA and CLAs are a blast to drive, but this particular feature uh, is, a, is really poor um, because of this kind of uh, response inhibition required. And so this is one of those cases where we can see the applications of something like executive attention in the design of an automobile, and in fact, a particularly bad design of an automobile. So that's a quick introduction to that two-factor theory of executive control. We're going to revisit it um, when we start talking about working memory capacity. I do want to say, you know, there's, as you may have noticed in uh, the field of cognition, uh, we get into arguments about what to talk about, and uh, you know, uh, the Engel paper, Engel and Kane make a really great argument for this being executive attention. Some people talk about it as a central executive. I, I think it's simply easiest to call it all executive functions, and, and I think a lot of people simply use that term. And so that's what we'll be doing from here on out. We'll be talking about executive functions as the way of thinking about it, whether it's central executive or executive attention. Um, for our purposes, I'm more interested in how uh, it works and the implications of it than what to call it. So that's what we're going to do from here on out, and we'll be talking about working memory capacity in our next lecture.